Welcome to The Visible Artist. My name is Sophie Loxton Lucas, and I'm excited to bring you this conversation with photographer Louise Long. Louise has created a thriving freelance career as a photographer and writer, and I was fascinated to hear how she's achieved this. We discuss alternative ways to exhibit her work as a photographer, how to balance personal and commercial work, and much, much more. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. I am delighted to be in the East London home of photographer Louise Long. After graduating with a Fine Art Photography Masters from the Royal College of Art, Louise has spent the last five years balancing her own practice with editorial projects. Collaboration plays a key role in Louise's practice. She has spent time with like-minded artists on residency programs in upstate New York, Paris and Bramola, Sweden, and enjoys working with other artists on art books to showcase her work in printed form. She has recently founded the Linseed Journal, due to launch soon, and this will feature work by photographers, illustrators and poets. For her editorial work, Louise combines her photography with writing. Her client list includes British Vogue, House and Garden and Wallpaper magazine, and she's interviewed incredible artists such as Felido Barlow and Paula Rego. I'm really interested to hear how she balances these different strands of her artistic career. Hi Louise, thank you so much for having me in your home. Hi, thanks so much for coming over. It's really lovely to be sitting here in your flat and I can see there's lots of um, beautiful objects in the room. Do you feel quite inspired being in here? Yes, I do actually. The light is really lovely. I mean, you're lucky to be here on a fairly bright day. Yeah, I think for me it's really important to have quite a, a clean space, but I tend to spend too much time rearranging various things. <laughs> well, I'm looking at this corner over there and it looks almost like a museum. I, I could see how you could spend a lot of time rearranging the ceramics and the postcards. No, I have to sort of keep my head down and sometimes take myself off and into the other room to do some more focused study where it's only the foxes outside that are distracting me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with your work. Could you describe your practice? So my practice is really a dual process of photography and writing. So that takes various forms from long-term personal projects, editorial assignments, and recently I'm sort of moving into magazine making and launching a new publication, print publication called Linseed Journal, which is shares lots of the themes in my work and is really a celebration of print and ideas connected to place and environment and culture. And all of this is rooted in your photography, fine art photography practice. Yes, that's right. So I think my practice really stems from research initially, and that can be navigating an environment with my camera, or it could be more focused study, and that can manifest through pictures and words, sometimes one or the other, sometimes combined. And can you tell me about one of your favourite recent series? So uh, actually for Lindsay Journal, I've been working with some really exciting artists and writers. I've been spending some time with a writer called Nancy Campbell, who currently is based in Oxfordshire on the Oxford Canal. And she is publishing a book this summer called Thunderstone. And I've been working on a photographic series in response to her work. Where actually, she's been very kind enough to work on a separate extract for Lindsay Journal for our first edition. And so I've had the pleasure of spending some time with her in this really unusual tract of land next to the canal, uh, sort of looking at the se- changes of the seasons. And that's, yeah, an analogue project in and around where she's living and along the canal is, and is connected to lots of the themes in her writing. Mm. And lots of your work is rooted in the landscape, isn't it? Yes, it is. So both urban and natural landscape, really, and sort of ideas of, of, of the human within that. So also the, the cultural landscape, you know, ideas of habitation and cultivation, graft. I think the last couple of years... I've probably had more of a the natural landscape coming into my work. I'm spending time out of London during lockdown, and I've sort of really found an affinity for gardening. <laughs> and, um, I think, yeah, the natural is sort of ever present. But mm. I think for me, it's really I just respond to whichever environment I'm in, and it's always really useful to kind of get out and and be somewhere new and and find ways to respond to that. Mm. And when I look at your images, they're really quite. I mean, you will have better ways of describing it, but very precise moments. Maybe it's sort of a drop on a leaf or the way the light's coming through in a very natural way. They feel very calm, peaceful images. Would you agree with that? Well, thank you. Um, I think so. I think people often describe my work as quite quiet, 
quite understated. I think it's really about sort of moving through the world and using my camera as a way to sort of navigate my environment. I think I'm less interested in photography as a document, as more as a sort of reflection of an experience of place. I've always been quite drawn to walking as part of my process, quite a productive way of being in the world. And I guess the quietness comes from that sort of pace of being, Mm -hmm. of, of movement as well. Lots of your practice has been influenced by residencies. You've travelled to New York and Paris and Sweden, haven't you, to to spend some time in those places and develop work? Yes, I have. It's actually been some of the most productive and inspiring time. I think just to have that dedicated space and time to be able to make work without all the sort of other things going on in an artist's life and just for someone to say, okay, well, you have a month now to really focus on exactly what you want to be doing here and and as I said because I do respond to place primarily being sort of planted in a particular environment is really generative I'm thinking back to my residency in upstate New York where there were three of us on a tract of land 100 eight acres of land it was in autumn and we essentially had no means of escape (laughs) but it was just so fortunate to have that time and also the dialogue with the other artists living and working together I absolutely loved looking at the other artists who participated on residency 108 108 had a look and it looked as though lots of their work was exploring the landscape obviously and creating very site-specific installations Yeah, exactly. It's all to do with ecologies of landscape and culture. And the artists who come there are are quite divergent sculptors, painters. I was there with a sculptor and a installation artist and a painter. It was just wonderful to have to come from such different perspectives, but to share that, to have that common thread in our work. The residency was in a farmhouse for a month and you were with two other artists. Did you know who they were beforehand? What was it like when you arrived? We'd never met. We met, I think, at the train station. We were picked up by the director of the residency, who's a really lovely woman who I've kept in touch with. And yeah, we just embarked on this month-long journey together. We'd have crits every week, which was really helpful. In the meantime, obviously, three of us were talking. We each had our own work space and at the end we were sort of given the opportunity to exhibit or install in any way that we felt fitting so I spent quite a lot of time doing site-specific work. Did you find that the other artists work really influenced what you were doing or were you working quite separately and then just giving feedback and feeling inspired by them or did you actually sort of change direction based on what they were doing? I think we were definitely inspired by the themes that each other were working on. We all had quite different practices, so I was focused more on photographic practices, installing cyanotype prints, doing drawings, doing lots of research. It was really interesting to see how, I think, towards the end, lots of our works did sort of find common threads, but in a way really nice that we all had very different sort of physical practices and could each sort of explore those quite independently. Mm. And to take things back a bit, you studied fine art photography at the Royal College of Art and spent two years there. Could you tell me more about that? What was How was the course structured and what was it like? Yeah, so it was a real throw in the deep end into the world of fine art. I knew when I was applying for masters that I wanted to be studying photography with within a fine art environment. So the course sits within the Fine Art School of Painting, Sculpture, Printmaking. And it's two years of theory and practice, again, which was quite important for me coming from a sort of art historical background. I knew that I was really interested in the sort of theory and critical discourse around uh, photography. So in terms of the course itself, it was quite open-ended and very self-motivated, mm. um, which was a little daunting having not come from a fine art BA. But it's a really inspiring environment, particularly in terms of the other students who are there. The rigour of thought and process that everyone is is undertaking is, is, is really amazing. You sort of gain so much just from spending time with the other students. Did you have one particular project at the end of the two years or what did you produce during that time? So again, you can work in any way you feel. You have crits every couple of weeks 
and then assessments at the end of each term. And then at the end of the two years, you have your grad show, which is sort of a big effort on everyone's part and is open to the public. So I was working on my final project for the last few months of the course. I'd actually been in Paris on a residency through the art school in the first term of that year. So the work had sort of led from there and then developed when I was back in London. And it was actually a project to do with an experience of insomnia, which is something I've had on and off most of my adult life. Um, But it was something I sort of decided to focus on through my photographic practice. And I produced a set of very large scale handprints which was quite an undertaking. I was lucky enough to be able to learn how to print in colour at the RCA with amazing technicians. So I spent sort of weeks on end, it felt like in the dark, <laughs> turning out these final prints. Yeah, it was it was a it was a really brilliant experience just to have that dedicated time to be able to to be in the dark room and try and create the best work you can is was amazing. Did you feel as though your tutors were pointing you in certain directions or were you free as you said it was quite sort of self-directed did you were you free to follow your own ideas and create your own work or did they very much channel you in a certain way no there was almost no channeling (laughs) I would say it was absolutely down to you which again I think that was the thing that I found the hardest because I've always been someone who's been interested in lots of different things and Mm. has had quite divergent artistic inclinations and so just to say okay this is what I'm going to focus on and I think it's always more more useful and you can get better results when you are much more focused so no it was really down to each student to to decide and everyone you know takes very various routes it must have been interesting to see how everyone evolved over two years and what they ended up with their graduate show yeah definitely some people came sort of very fully fledged as artists and others like myself had quite different backgrounds but it's it's a really rewarding environment and everyone's very supportive and because people do generally have very different ways of working it doesn't feel competitive in the way that you might get elsewhere. Mm. Well, it sounds as though it was very much focused on the fine art photography rather than the commercial side of being a photographer. How have you found it since your master's? Because you finished with a distinction, so you obviously, <laughs> obviously you did very well. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> well, yes, you're right. It is very much fine art oriented. So there was almost no discussion about any commercial aspect of being an artist during the masters, which I say was one minor downside and something you sort of have to seek out yourself. There are always opportunities to talk to tutors and technicians and other students. So I'd sort of really encourage that. I think for me, because I'd come from a different background, a more commercial photography background, I sort of always had in the back of my mind that that was something that you could, you know, balance more commercial and more artistic sides of your practice. So initially on graduating, I was quite focused on applying for residencies and group exhibitions. And it was really wonderful to participate in those. And then I sort of realised that actually to sustain yourself, you do need to, in my case, at least look for a more sort of various portfolio of of work. So since then, I've been really sort of balancing an editorial practice with my own fine art personal projects and a practice that also incorporates writing so I'm able to sort of straddle different threads of things. Mm -hmm. And do you enjoy that balance? Yes I do. I've always had quite an eclectic outlook and for me writing has always been in the background and actually increasingly at the forefront of what I'm doing and it's really nice to be able to put to words the some of the research that I'm doing and the conversations that I'm having with other people. Mm -hmm. And when you say editorial work, what do you mean by that? So that is generally assignments or commissions from from magazines. So in my case, that is sometimes words and pictures, or sometimes just one or the other. And it can be anything from big established magazines to smaller independent titles. And generally, the smaller and the more independent, the more creative freedom Mm. you have. So it's really lovely to be able to, to do those. And I'm often pitching ideas of things that you know, I'd like to go and do or like to go and research and write about or fully fledged projects. So yeah, it's it's quite a varied mix. So usually do your commissions come from ideas that you've pitched directly to the editors or do they come to you now that you're more established? I think initially it was definitely a lot of time pitching and 
most new titles that I work with will be because I've reached out to them. Once you've sort of done something with someone, then it's easier to try again. And yeah, it's it's also really great to just get people contacting you out of the blue. That's really nice as well. Mm. Um, but it's often because they've seen you do something similar or have a particular interest. And is it usually the photography that leads or do you have the idea for words and then you accompany it with photography? It can be either. I think it's surprising how still the two streams have run quite differently, particularly for bigger titles. So for me, it was often a case of pitching a story idea and then saying, I could accompany that with images and normally mm. people are quite pleased yeah but sometimes you know their run is completely different departments and you have to accept that you know they'll have different commissioning processes mm. but then equally it could just be a photographic project that I pitch on its own I think normally with images with a with a photo series you really need to have something more tangible to show for that and so it'd normally be a finished series or at least some kind of research material that I've already done that sort of reflects what the final outcome would be. Mm. And you've interviewed some really amazing artists, haven't you, for publications like British Vogue? Yes, no, I've been really <laughs> lucky to meet some really wonderful people, which is, again, I feel quite chameleon-like lots of days because, yeah, I have different tasks in my diary, but there's uh, lots of highlights. But um, I loved meeting Philida Barlow. Yes, that's um, what I was, I was thinking about. <laughs> that must have been amazing. Yeah, I mean, she's obviously an extraordinary artist and I gather a really incredible teacher as well. But she was just so warm and so open, spoke so articulately. And no, I felt so fortunate to be able to meet her in relation to her exhibition at the Royal Academy. Mm -hmm. That must have been amazing. Yes, no, it was. She was really generous with her time because I think, if I remember correctly, they were still installing. So she was good enough to let me run around and capture her in the space. She was just really a warm person to me and most people aren't that excited about doing press. <laughs> um, so no, I was very grateful to her. And was it a challenge trying to capture her and her work? I mean, they're huge pieces sometimes. Yes, it was actually. Um and uh, on a sort of very practical note, I actually don't really like using wide-angled lenses. <laughs> so I think for me it was a challenge. But I'm always most interested in capturing people in their environment, um, environmental portraiture, I think it gets called. So for me, that's always more interesting and nice to be able to work with natural light. And talking about the environments, you interviewed Paula Rego and then shot her studio. That must have been really fascinating. Yes, that was really amazing. She famously has this incredible studio in North London. Each of her paintings is normally worked from life, often from maquettes and models. She's been working with her studio assistant, Lila, who now looks after the studio, who was there and showed me around. And it was like being a sort of backstage of a theatre. That was really special and to sort of see the nuts and bolts that go into the paintings, you can sort of feel the, the three-dimensionality of them even more. I imagine that when you go into a really fascinating space, it's hard to edit down all your images. You hard to choose just a small selection when there's so much to see. Yes, it is. I try to be quite sparing. And actually, with my analogue projects, I'm really sparing, particularly when I'm working with medium format when you only have 12 images on a roll, it's it's quite a nice sort of self-editing process. Mm. Increasingly with editorial work, it's much more digital. But I still try to not sort of take hundreds and hundreds of images because I think you can just get lost and just be a bit more present and try and sort of translate the slower process of film into the, the digital method is, is quite useful. That leads me on to your new project, Lindsay Journal. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so Linseed has been coming to fruition for the last year or so, out of lockdown really, and it's a celebration of print. So it's quite a large scale print publication, really looking at the intersection of culture and environment. And I'm lucky enough to be working with artists, writers, illustrators from all over the world, but really our stance is local particularity so looking at ideas connected to place making on a local scale and it's really spans everything from sort of more journalistic pieces to contemporary poetry commissioning illustrators working with photographers and alongside of a brilliant designer who has got a really keen eye for 
for all of the graphic design and we're sort of no effort is being spared in terms of looking at <laughs> everything from you know paper stocks to typography so it's it's been a real joy to work on and to have talented team of people around me as well mm. so you're sort of working on the other side of things commissioning others to cre- create for the journal Yes, exactly. From the beginning, I sort of wanted to try and make it as nice a process for everyone as I can. And and really, my hope is just for everyone who's been part of the publication just feels proud to be part of it, because it is really just all of our own making. And being on the commissioning side, I think, is a real privilege. And I think you have to you know, really respect everyone's contributions. Mm. And I deliberately wanted to be opening out to as broad a community as I could. So we had an open call and was really flattered by all the responses that we got. So what sort of responses did you have? So really varied responses. So, you know, everything from, like I said, poetry to journalists based in Kenya, Ireland, Canada, and then lots of artists as well. I've also then commissioned people to collaborate with some of those open call responses so whether that's illustrators for poetry or photographers to accompany someone's written feature but I really wanted to make sure that people had you know a real reason for being there and try to find people based in the location that was being spoken about okay yeah um and so spent quite a lot of time trying to find the right person um for each feature Mm. and these will all be all come together in a physical magazine publication yeah so our first printed edition um will be with us in the next few months hopefully and we're incorporating lots of different paper stocks we wanted to really give artists the space as well to have something in print because i know i've always loved the analog and the Mm. tactility of print of the printed medium and so i think that was something that we wanted to to really celebrate Mm. and as a photographer you must be particularly conscious of the images looking good in print coming out well yes definitely and you really have to invest in the right paper stocks the right printing methods there's also something fun to you know be more experimental about it and we're really seeing the publication as a sort of collection of threads so trying to draw ideas between different places and different artistic mediums so in some places we're using sort of very fine sort of newsproof and in other places much more sort of luxurious paper stock and really just kind of reflect whatever's going on in that particular project Mm, it sounds fascinating i can't wait to see it (laughs) oh well i can't wait to hear what you think about it when it comes out can you tell me about your photographic books that you've worked on Yeah, so for me, book projects have always been a really useful way of working through and presenting material. Firstly, sort of comes through an editing process, and then it's really about thinking about series, which is sort of a key part of photography, and and then really, yeah, taking pleasure in paper and you know the physicality of something. And and for me, the book um, is much as an object as a print in a frame or not might be so I've worked on some sort of handmade book projects my final degree show I made a handmade book uh, to accompany my final project and then exhibited that off print and that was really just also an excuse to learn about you know book making and, mm. and binding and then since then have tried to create books or zines for my personal projects as a way to to sort of find a final edit and and allow them to come to life. Often Mm. you have such a huge archive as a photographer, it's nice to actually sort of produce something and feel like it's got some kind of finality to it. Yes, uh, that makes complete sense. And do you choose to do that rather than produce limited edition prints of your work? I think increasingly so, perhaps over the last couple of years, sort of necessarily because of pandemic less work being shown physically but I do still work on um, print commissions mostly people who come to me and you know applying for to be in group shows they might just be one-off images but I think I've always had a particular love for books and Mm. printed ephemera so I think that will always be a really key part of my process Mm. so if someone wanted to have one of your works in their home is that something you would do if they approached you because I'm thinking of your work and I can imagine they'd be very popular 
Oh, thank you. Well, yes, no, I do. People do um, come to me and I work with a couple of London printers or where I can, I'll go and print in the dark room. So no, it is, it's definitely a part of my process and something that I might think to sort of amp up. So yeah, lots of different things happening. <laughs> it's really interesting hearing about it because I think there will be a lot of photographers that are maybe in a position where they've completed a degree and they have a large body of work or lots of different series is what direction do you go in after that but it sounds as though you've found quite a few different ways to get your work out there show your work and create a living but not necessarily just down the route of exhibiting and selling prints yeah I think it's a really difficult question for artists and graduates it becomes quite obvious quite quickly how difficult it is to really survive if you know you're not immediately being offered kind of big exhibitions or being invited to residencies all over the place and getting all the awards I think you have to be well for me I felt like I had to be quite open-minded about what it was that contributed to my practice and I think I was always open to the idea of it being a balance of personal work editorial work commercial work and as long as I'm able to dedicate time to my own projects and I think that that works and I'd love to continue doing residencies and working with different people and I think everybody's doing you know 10 jobs anyway (laughs) (laughs) so I think as long as you can find things that are fulfilling within that then Mm. for me that's that's enough I think it's really exciting because you found these directions but you're able to hold on to the essence of your fine art photography practice which is as you say lots of people see it's quite sort of calm and thoughtful and it doesn't it's hard I think to make that work successful because it doesn't in itself like shout and grab people's attention it requires people to look at it thoughtfully um I don't know if I'm making sense here (laughs) but do, do you know what I mean it it's I think it'd be easy to lose that if you were trying to be more commercial I guess yes I think so I think you do have to be very um single minded whether you're either just trying to market yourself for the art world or you know in photography, whether you're just trying to be a commercial photographer. I think I've been able to hold on to the essence of my work just through balancing different sides of my practice. And as long as I'm able to go out and be in places and have the time and space, I think you also have to be realistic about being flexible. So if you are being commissioned to do things, it's sort of accepting that there are expectations and certain requirements, but then allowing yourself, you know, your own total creative freedom somewhere else. The flip side of it is that some people might find that, you know, that they're immediately taken up by a gallery, but then a sort of being channeled into doing one thing, potentially, which isn't that fulfilling for long term. So, you know, there are ups and, and and downsides to just doing one thing mm. I think that's really good advice it's something that I always ask my interviewees so I think to finish I'd love to ask you about living in East London we're here in Hackney how do you find living in this area do you find it inspiring as an artist yes I do I really love it I'm right next to Victoria Park which is a real oasis most days <laughs> and um I I think it's the perfect spot for me. I do like to be able to travel when I can, but I think being in the centre of a creative community, having access to exhibitions, shows that are going on, and you know, being able to easily meet up with people, and I think particularly after the pandemic, it's so great to be able to meet people in person. As you say, there's so many creatives around here. It's obviously an art hub, so it's exciting to be in the centre of that. It's also a beautiful area as well. Well, thank you so much, Louise. We will be looking out for the Lindsay Journal. I can't wait to see that and all your other projects as well. Oh, thank you, Sophie. It was really wonderful to talk. Thank you for listening this week. Please follow Louise at Louise Long and Linseed underscore journal. And this is the final episode of season one. So thank you to everyone who supported the podcast so far. I've got a brilliant lineup of 12 conversations for season two. So stay tuned.